Representation theory of finite groups, lecture six, problem session. So today we will try to solve several problems related to the content of the first five lectures. Problem one. The dihedral group D2 times four acts, by definition, on the set of vertices of the square inscribed in the unit circle in R2. Decompose explicitly the linearization of this action into a direct sum of simple modules. So here is a picture illustrating the setup. We have R2 and the unit circle in it. We have the square inscribed in this unit circle such that one of the vertices of the square is the point 1, 0. Let us denote the vertices of the square by 1, 2, 3, and 4, starting from our special vertex 1, 0, and going around the circle in the counterclockwise direction. Let us think how we can encode the elements of our dihedral group. The dihedral group is generated, for example, by the following two elements. The first one is the counterclockwise rotation by 90 degrees. This rotation sends the vertex 1 to the vertex 2, the vertex 2 to the vertex 3, the vertex 3 to the vertex 4, and the vertex 4 to the vertex 1. So therefore, it is given by the following permutation. 1 goes to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, and 4 to 1. The second element which generates a dihedral group is the reflection in the horizontal line. So such a reflection stabilizes the vertices 1 and 3 and swaps the vertices 2 and 4. Therefore, it corresponds to the following permutation of the vertices. So 1 goes to 1, 2 to 4, 3 to 3, and 4 to 2. Okay, let us denote the linearization of this action of d2 times 4 on the vertices by m. The standard basis of this linearization consists of the vertices. So they are 1, 2, 3, and 4, and they are denoted in this bold font to distinguish them from the numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4. As usual, we have the following trick which works for any action of finite group on a finite set. So if we consider the linear combination of the elements of this finite set with coefficient 1, so which is just given by the sum of the elements in the standard basis, let's denote this element by u. So it's 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. Then any element in our group just permutes the elements of the standard basis. So it sends the element u to itself. So in particular, r of u is equal to u and s of u is equal to u. So therefore, the one-dimensional space generated by this element, let's call it capital U, it's a submodule of M. It is simple because it is one-dimensional and it's actually isomorphic to the trivial G module. Okay, in this particular case, we can do a slight variation of this trick. We can consider the linear combination of the elements of the standard basis with alternating coefficients. So we take the element 1, minus 2, plus 3, and minus 4. Let's denote this element by V. So if we apply to V the rotation R, so R sends 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, and 4 to 1. So we see that it changes the sign of all coefficients. So therefore, R of V is equal to minus V. The element S preserves 1 and 3 and swaps 2 and 4. This means that S of V is equal to V. So therefore, the one-dimensional subspace generated by the element V, let's denote it by capital V, it's a submodule of M because it is stable under the action of both elements R and S. It's a simple submodule because it has dimension 1, and it is not isomorphic to the trivial 
module over the dihedral group because R doesn't act trivially here, it acts with a sign. We have now found two one-dimensional submodules of M, and in order to find the rest, we can use the unitarization trick, which was used during the proof of Marshke's theorem. So consider the Hermitian inner product on our module for which the standard basis is orthonormal. Since each element of our dihedral group permutes the elements in the standard basis, it acts as a unitary operator with respect to this inner product. In particular, the inner product is invariant under this action of the dihedral group. Now let us consider the orthogonal complement to our two elements u and v. So the element u has coefficients 1, 1, 1, 1 in the standard basis, and the element v has coefficients 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1 in the standard basis. So since the standard basis is orthonormal, the orthogonal complement to u and v is given, for example, by the following two vectors, 1, 0, minus 1, 0, and 0, 1, 0, minus 1. So the orthogonal complement should have dimension 2. These two elements are obviously linearly independent, and the scalar product of the first element with u is equal to 1 plus 0 minus 1 plus 0, which is 0, and similarly the scalar product with v is also 0. Similarly for the second element. So we denote them by w1 and w2. So these two elements generate the orthogonal complement. And from the proof of Marshke's theorem, we know that the linear span of these two elements is actually a submodule of our module M. Next, let us try to compute the matrices of the action of our elements R and S in this basis w1 and w2 of w. So R cyclically rotates the coefficient, so it moves the element w1 to w2, and it moves the element w2 to minus w1, because here the, co the second coefficient 1 will go to the third coefficient 1, while in w1 it's minus 1. So the matrix is 0, minus 1, 1, 0. The matrix of the action of the element S, so S preserves vertices 1 and 3 and swaps 2 and 4. So w1 goes to itself and w2 goes to minus w2 because the coefficients will be swapped. In particular, the matrix of the element S is a diagonal matrix with 1 and minus 1 on the diagonal. So this matrix has two eigenvalues, 1 and minus 1, both with multiplicity 1. So this matrix has only two eigenvectors up to complex scalars. So these are exactly w1 and w2. None of these two vectors is an eigenvector for the matrix R. So it follows that w does not have one-dimensional submodules, because any one-dimensional submodule must consist of eigenvectors for both R and S. But since it has dimension 2, it follows that it doesn't have proper submodules, and hence it is simple. So the answer to our problem is that the module M is a direct sum of the submodules U, V, and W. Problem 2. Prove that a finite group G is abelian if and only if all simple G modules have dimension 1. Let us start with the proof of the if part. Assume that all simple G modules have dimension 1. Let L1, L2, and so on Lk be a complete and irredundant list of simple G modules. We know that each simple G module appears in the regular G module with multiplicity equal to its dimension. And by our assumption, all these modules have dimension 1. This means that the regular G module CG is isomorphic to the direct sum of L1, L2, and so on Lk. So since the, each Li is one-dimensional, the action of an element 
g in our group g on this li is given by some scalar. So now if you go to the direct sum, the action of each element g on the regular module, if we choose in the regular module the basis compatible with this direct sum decomposition, then the action of any element in G on the regular module is given by a diagonal matrix. But we know that all diagonal matrices commute. We also know that the action of the group G on the regular module is faithful in the sense that different elements of the group are represented by different linear operators on the regular module. So, for example, because different elements of the group move the element E in the regular module to different vectors. So, which means that they must be represented by different linear operators. In other words, the group G is a subgroup in the group of all invertible linear operators on the regular module. And the action of this group on this module is given by the diagonal matrices and those commute. Consequently, the elements of G commute. So this solves the if part of our problem. Let us now discuss the only if part. So assume that G is a commutative group. Let V be a simple G module. Since G is commutative, the action of any element G in G on the module V gives an endomorphism of this G module because it commutes with the action of all other elements. By Schurz's lemma, each endomorphism of a simple module is a scalar multiple of the identity. This means that all elements in G act on the module V as scalars. But then we have that any subspace of V is invariant under the action of G, because any subspace is invariant under the action of scalars. Since we assume that V is simple, it follows that V cannot have any proper subspaces. The only non-zero vector spaces which do not have proper subspaces are one-dimensional vector spaces. Therefore, V must have dimension one. So this completes the proof of problem two. Problem three. The symmetric group S3 acts on the set of all subsets of the set 1, 2, and 3. Determine the multiplicity of all simple S3 modules in the linearization M of this action. So let us start by listing all subsets of 1 to 3. We split these subsets according to their cardinality. So we have one subset of cardinality zero, the empty set, and we denote it by V zero. So this is the element of this linearization action. We have three subsets of cardinality one, one, two, and three. So the corresponding basis vectors are V one, V two, and V three. We have three subsets of cardinality two, one, two, two, three, and one, three. The corresponding basis vectors are v12, v23, and v13. And finally, we have one subset of cardinality 3, which is the whole set 1, 2, 3. And the corresponding basis vector is v123. The action of the symmetric group S3 obviously preserves cardinality because different elements are sent to different elements. Let us also recall the classification of simple S3 modules. We have the trivial one-dimensional module C triv. All elements of the group act as the identity. We have the sine module C sine. It's one-dimensional module. The even elements of S3 act as the identity, and the odd elements act as multiplication by minus one. And also we have the two-dimensional simple module V. One way to think about V is to recall that S3 is isomorphic to the dihedral group D2 times 3. So if we consider the action of D2 times 3 on the vertices of the triangle, which is inscribed into the unit circle. And then V is just a defining module over D2 times 3. It's two-dimensional, and we know that it is simple. So it's a complexification of the defining action of D2 times 3 
on R2, which preserves the triangle inscribed into the unit circle. Okay, so let us now try to solve our problem. Clearly, the linear span of the empty set is a submodule, because if you apply something to an empty set, you get an empty set. So it's a submodule, and the action of all elements of S3 is trivial, so it's a trivial submodule of S3. Similarly, the linear span of the whole set 1, 2, 3 is a submodule. If you apply a permutation to 1, 2, 3 as a set, you will get 1, 2, 3 as a set. So it's again a submodule isomorphic to the trivial module S3. Clearly, the linear span of V1, V2, and V3 is a submodule. The action of the symmetric group it preserves cardinality. And by definition, if we apply a permutation sigma to Vi, we get V with the index sigma of i. And this holds for any permutation sigma or for any i from 1, 2, and 3. Therefore, by definition, this linear span is isomorphic to the natural S3 module. And we have seen that the natural S3 module is isomorphic to the direct sum of the trivial module and the two-dimensional simple module V. Next observation, the linear span of all subspaces of cardinality 2 is obviously a submodule. The action of the symmetric group preserves the cardinality. Let's introduce a new notation for the subsets of cardinality 2. We denote each subset by its complement, which has one element. So we denote by v1 hat the element v23, we denote by v2 hat the element v13, and we denote by v3 hat the element v12. And then with this notation, we see that applying a permutation sigma to vi hat, we get the element v with the index sigma of i hat for any i in 1, 2, 3. So this means that the linear span of v12, v23, and v13 is isomorphic to the natural S3 module. And we know that the natural module is a direct sum of the trivial one and the two-dimensional simple V. And now let us collect together all these results for cardinality 0, for cardinality 3, cardinality 1, and cardinality 2. So the trivial mod module appears four times, one time for each cardinality. The sign module never appears, so its multiplicity is zero. And the simple module V appears twice, multiplicity is two, once for cardinality one and once for cardinality two. Problem four. The symmetric group S3 acts on the polynomial algebra in three variables x1 and two and x3 by automorphisms by the following action. So sigma of x sub i is equal by definition to x with the index sigma of i for any permutation sigma and any i in 1 to 3. Determine the multiplicity of all simple S3 modules in the restriction of this action to the linear span of all monomials of degree 3. So the basis of our module m is given by all monomials of degree 3. So these are x1 cube, x2 cube, x3 cube, x1 squared x2, x1 squared x3, x2 squared x1, x2 squared x3, x3 squared x1, x3 squared x2, and x1, x2, and x3. Note that the action of the symmetric group permutes the elements of this basis by definition. And the orbits of this action are as follows. The first orbit consists of the cubes of all our variables. The second orbit consists of the elements x1 squared x2, x1 squared x3, and so on. And the last orbit consists of one element x1, x2, x3. So let us denote by capital X, the linear span of the first orbit, so of the cubes, by Y, 
the linear span of the elements in the second orbit, so of the elements of the form x1 squared, x2, and so on. And by that, the linear span of this unique monomial x1, x2, x3. It is obvious that the action of the symmetric group preserves the monomial x1, x2, x3. So in particular, the module z is the trivial module. So if you denote the cube of xi by vi, then sigma of vi is equal to v sigma of i for any sigma in S3 and any i in 1 to 3. Consequently, the submodule X is isomorphic to the natural S3 module, and we know that in the natural S3 module, the trivial simple S3 module has multiplicity 1, the cyan module has multiplicity 0, and the two-dimensional module V has multiplicity 1. By the universal properties of the regular module over S3, there is a unique homomorphism from this regular module to the module Y, which sends the identity element in the regular module to the element x1 squared x2 in Y. So in fact, for any module M and for any fixed element in that module, there is a unique homomorphism from the regular module, which sends the identity to that fixed element. But then we can observe that applying to x1 square x2 all permutations, we will get a basis of y. If you go to the list of elements which generate y, we see that here is our element x1 squared x2. The transposition of 2 and 3 sends it to x1 squared x3. The transposition of 1 and 3 sends it to x3 squared x2 and so on. If we apply all six elements in S3 to x1 squared x2, we will get exactly these six monomials. Consequently, the homomorphism from the regular module to Y is bijective, so it's an isomorphism. So the module Y is just isomorphic to the regular module. And we know that each simple module appears in the regular module with multiplicity given by its dimension. So the multiplicity of the trivial module in Y is 1, the multiplicity of the sine module in Y is 1, and the multiplicity of the two-dimensional module V in Y is 2. If we combine the multiplicities in Z, X, and Y, we see that the multiplicity of the trivial module is 3, so it appears once in Y, once in X, and once in Z. The multiplicity of the sine module is 1, it only appears once in y, and the multiplicity of the simple module v is 3, it appears twice in y and once in x. Problem 5. Construct an explicit basis in the space of homomorphisms from the natural S3 module to the regular S3 module. So let m denote the natural S3 module. We know that the natural module is a direct sum of the trivial module and the two-dimensional simple module V. We also know that the regular module is a direct sum of the trivial module, the sine module, and two copies of the module V. So we want to determine the dimension of the space of homomorphisms from M to the regular module. Since bifunctor home is biadditive, so it's additive in each argument, so we can use Schur's lemma and see that we can send the trivial module from M to the trivial module in the regular module only once. So we have one dimension of homomorphisms here. And we can send the module V to two copies of V in the regular module. So here the dimension is two. So adding these things up, we get that the dimension of the home space from M to the regular module is 3. So therefore, our assignment is to construct three linearly independent homomorphisms from M to the regular module. So the standard basis of the natural module consists of the elements 1, 2, and 3. So let us list the elements in the group S3 as follows. So S3 consists of the elements E, S, T, ST, TS, and W0, 
which is equal to STS and is also equal to TST, where S is a transposition of 1 and 2, and T is a transposition of 2 and 3. Let us observe that the basis element 1 in the natural module M has the property that if you apply T to it, then nothing happens. So T of 1 is equal to 1 because T is a transposition of 2 and 3, so this does not affect the element 1. Therefore, any homomorphism from M to the regular module should send the basis element 1 to some element V in the regular module, which has the same property, that T of V is equal to V. So 1 should be sent to an eigenvector of T in the regular module with eigenvalue 1. The next observation is that any homomorphism from M to the regular module is uniquely determined by the image of 1. Indeed, the element 2 in the regular module is the image of the element 1 under the action of S. So therefore, phi of 2 should be equal to S of phi of 1. And the element 3 in the natural module is the image of 2 under the action of T. Therefore, phi of 3 should be equal to t of phi of 2. So the image phi of 1 uniquely determines the image of 2, and it uniquely determines the image of 3. So since the linear map is uniquely determined on the basis, phi is uniquely determined by the image of 1. So then we reduce the problem to the problem. Can we describe the eigenvectors for t on the regular module with eigenvalue 1. So if you want to describe the eigenvectors, we need the matrix. And the matrix of the action of t on the regular module in the standard basis of the regular module is as follows. So t applied to E gives us t. So the first basis vector is sent to the third basis vector, and t squared is the identity. This means that the third basis vector is sent to the first basis vector. The second basis vector S is sent to TS, so this is a fifth basis vector. So the second basis vector in the column 2, we have 1 in row 5. And similarly, the fifth basis vector goes to the second basis vector. In column 5, 1 is in row 2. And finally, the fourth basis vector ST goes to W0. So in the fourth column, we have the the one in the sixth row, and in the sixth column we have one in the fourth row. So this matrix, if you compute its eigenvalues, it has eigenvalue 1 with multiplicity 3, and also eigenvalue minus 1 with multiplicity 3. And the three linearly independent eigenvectors for eigenvalue 1 are the vectors 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. So we denote them by v1, v2, and v3, respectively. And since we already know that the dimension of the home space is 3, so each of these eigenvectors realizes a unique homomorphism from the natural module to the regular module. So we have three homomorphisms which send the element 1 in the natural module to v1, v2, and v3 respectively. So let's write them down. So here is the answer. So we have the first homomorphism phi1. It sends 1 to the vector corresponding to v1. So v1 had coefficients 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. It means that the corresponding vector in the regular module is e plus t. And the element 2 is sent to s applied to e plus t, which is s plus s t. And the element 3 in the natural module is sent to T applied to S plus ST, which is TS plus W0. Similarly, we have the second homomorphism phi2, which sends 1 to S plus TS. So this is the element of the regular module corresponding to V2. So this sends 2 to E plus W0. So this is S applied to S plus TS. And it sends 3 to T plus ST. This is T applied to E plus W0. And finally, we had the third homomorphism 5, 3, which sends 1 to st plus w0. So this is the element corresponding to v3. 
It sends two to t plus ts. This is s applied to st plus w0. And it sends three to e plus s. This is t applied to t plus ts. So this is the answer to problem number five. Problem six. Consider a cube in the three-dimensional real space whose center is at the origin. Let G be the group of all rotational symmetries of this cube. Prove that the complexification M of the defining representation of G is irreducible. So let us first draw a picture. Let us choose a coordinate system in R2 such that we have the following picture. So we have a cube, its center is in the origin, and the coordinate axis goes through the centers of three faces of this cube. So let's work with this picture, then it will be easier for us to describe rotational symmetries of this cube as linear transformations of R2. So the first rotational symmetry which we consider is a rotational symmetry which we denote by Rx, given by rotating around the x-axis by 90 degrees counterclockwise. So we have the rotation counterclockwise, the rotation axis is the x-axis, and this rotation sends the axis y to z and z to minus y. So the matrix of this rotation is as follows. The basis vector for x is preserved, the basis vector for y is sent to the basis vector for z, and the basis vector for z is sent to minus the basis vector for y. So we will denote by the bold i a fixed imaginary unit, so a complex number which squares 2 minus 1. Then after this notation, the matrix Rx has three eigenvalues, the eigenvalue 1, the eigenvalue i, and the eigenvalue minus i, and each of them has multiplicity 1. And then we can compute the eigenvectors. For the eigenvalue 1, the eigenvector is obviously 1, 0, 0. For, for the eigenvalue i, the eigenvector is 0, i, 1. So if you multiply this vector with our matrix, so the first row gives 0, in the second row we have minus 1, and minus 1 is exactly i times i. And in the third row we have i, which is exactly i times 1. And finally, for the eigenvalue minus i, we have the eigenvector 0, i, minus 1. And since all eigenvalues are multiplicity free, they have multiplicity 1, the only proper subspaces which are invariant with respect to this matrix are the linear spans of different eigenvectors. So we have the subspaces spanned by u, by v, and by w. So these are our three different eigenvectors. And then by their pairs, the subspace spanned by u and v, by u and w, and by v and w. Next, let us consider the rotational symmetry Ry of our cube, given by rotating around the x-axis by 90 degrees counterclockwise. So if we go to our picture, this is the y-axis, we rotate around it counterclockwise, and this sends the z-axis to the x-axis, and the x-axis to minus z-axis. So the matrix of this symmetry Ry is as follows. So the y-axis is fixed, so the second uh, basis vector is sent to itself. The first basis vector is sent to minus the third basis vector, and the third basis vector is sent to the first basis vector. So we only have six potential submodules, the invariant subspaces for the first matrix. Let's check all of them. So the first one, Cu, is not invariant under the second matrix because if we apply this matrix to 1, 0, 0, we get 0, 0, minus 1. This is not in Cu. Cv is not invariant for this matrix because if we apply this matrix to 0, i1, we get 1 in the first coordinate. This is not in the linear span of V. And Cw is not invariant because if we apply this matrix to the third vector, 0, i, minus 1, we get the non-zero first coordinate. Doesn't work. 
So CUV is not invariant because applying the matrix to U, which is 1, 0, 1, we get 0, 0, minus 1. This is not in the linear span of U and V. And similarly, CUW is not invariant. And CVW is not invariant because applying the matrix to V, we get the non-zero first coordinate. This is not in the linear span of V and W. So none of the potential submodules work, which means that M does not have proper submodules and SAS is a simple module. So this completes the solution of problem six. Problem seven, find an explicit decomposition into a direct sum of simple submodules for the tensor product of the defining module M over the dihedral group D2 times six with itself. So here is the picture of the setup. We have R2 and the unit circle, and then we have a regular hexagon inscribed in this unit circle, such that one of the vertices is the vector 1, 0. So the generating elements of the dihedral group D2 times 6 are, for example, the following two elements. The first one is a counterclockwise rotation by 60 degrees. So in the standard basis of R2, it has a matrix one half of one minus root of three, root of three, one. So these are basically cos, sine, minus sine, and cos of the angle pi over three. And the second generating element is a reflection in the horizontal line. And this reflection has the following matrix in the standard basis. So the first standard basis element is not moved. It's one zero in the first column. And the second standard basis element goes to minus itself. So it's zero minus one in the second column. So let's denote the standard basis of this module by V1 and V2. Then the standard basis of this tensor product of this module is itself is given by the elements V1 tensor V1, V1 tensor V2, V2 tensor V1, and V2 tensor V2. So using the definition of how elements of the group act on the tensor product, we can compute the matrices of the action of the elements R and S in this standard basis of the tensor product. The matrix of S is very easy. It's a diagonal matrix with elements 1, minus 1, minus 1, and 1 on the diagonal. And the matrix of R is more complicated, so it's 1 divided by 4 of the following matrix with coefficients 1, minus root of 3, minus root of 3, 3, root of 3, 1, minus 3, minus root of 3, root of 3, minus 3, 1, minus root of 3, 3, root of 3, root of 3, 1. So we can do an easy guess. So if you take an element 1, 0, 0, 1, then apply an S to it, we get itself. And applying R to it, we get 4, 0, 0, 4, and then divide by 4. So we get again the element U. So it's the, this element is a common eigenvector for both these matrices with eigenvalue 1. Therefore, the one-dimensional subspace generated by this element is invariant under the action. So it gives us a submodule. It is simple because it's one-dimensional. And it's isomorphic to the trivial module. So we have already found one trivial submodule of this tensor product. So we can do another easy guess. The element 0, 1, minus 1, 0 is also a common eigenvector. So if we multiply 0, 1, minus 1, 0 with S, we get 0, minus 1, 1, 0. So for S, the eigenvalue is minus 1. And for R, the eigenvalue is, so we have 0 here, 4 minus 4, 0. So it's 0, 1 minus 1, 0. So for R, the eigenvalue is 1, and for S, the eigenvalue is minus 1. Therefore, the linear span of this element is a simple submodule of the tensor product. It has dimension 1. And this module is some kind of sine module. At least S acts as minus 1. R, R is not a reflection, only the force power of R is equal to the identity. But, so it's some version of the sine module. The next step is to determine the other eigenvalues of the matrix of R. 
So it's a complicated matrix, but still one can compute the characteristic polynomial of this matrix and determine that the two other eigenvalues of this matrix are minus one plus root of three i divided by two and minus one minus root of three i divided by two. So the eigenvector for the first eigenvalue is the element minus one i i one. And the eigenvector for the second eigenvalue is the element minus one minus i minus i and one. It is easy to check that none of these two eigenvectors for R is an eigenvector for S. Therefore, the linear span of these two eigenvectors is actually a submodule of the tensor product and it's two dimensional. It doesn't have one dimensional submodules because there are no other common eigenvectors. So therefore, it's a simple two-dimensional submodule of our tensor product. So the answer is the tensor product of M with itself decomposes into a direct sum of submodules U, W, and A. Here is a small appendix about eigenvalues and eigenvectors for tensor products. Claim, if G is an element of a finite group G, which has the complete set of eigenvalues lambda i on some module v, and which has complete set of eigenvalues mu j on some module w, then the eigenvalues of g on the tensor product of v and w are exactly the products of lambda i's and mu j's. Proof. First of all, we know that g to the power the cardinality of the group g is the identity, which means that the linear operator, which represents the action of G on any module, has the annihilating polynomial x to the power of the cardinality of G minus 1. And this polynomial does not have multiple roots. Therefore, the linear operator representing the action of G must be diagonalizable. Now, if we have two eigenvectors for G, the element v in v with eigenvalue lambda and the element w in w with eigenvalue mu, let us try to see what happens if we apply g to the tensor product of little v and little w. So by definition, this is equal to g of v tensor g of w. So g of v is lambda v, g of w is mu w, and we can move scalars from each of the components of the tensor product. So we get that v tensor w is an eigenvector for G with the eigenvalue lambda mu. So we can take the eigenbasis for G in V with the corresponding eigenvalues lambda i's. We can take an eigenbasis for G on W with the corresponding eigenvalues mu j's and the tensor products of the elements in this basis for V and in this basis of W will be an eigenbasis of the action of G on V tensor W and the eigenvalues will be exactly the products of the eigenvalues in the factors. This proves our claim. So M is a defining representation of the dihedral group, and R is a rotation in a two-dimensional space by the angle of 60 degrees. So it's uh, 2 pi over 6. So this means that the eigenvalues of this rotation are exactly 1 plus minus root of 3i divided by 2. So these are the exponents of plus and minus angles 2 pi over 6 times i. So these are the eigenvalues of r on m. If you want to compute the eigenvalues of r on the tensor product of m with itself, so we should take the set consisting of the exponents of plus 2 pi i over 6 and the exponent of minus 2 pi i over 6 and multiply with itself. So when the plus meets the minus, we get 0. And this happens twice. So we will have the exponent of 0, which is 1, with multiplicity 2. And the two other elements will be the exponents of the double angles, which mean the exponents of plus and minus 4 pi i over 6. And these are exactly the elements minus 1 plus minus root of 3 i over 2, which we had on the previous slide. Let us finish with some additional problems and questions. Question 1. Classify all simple modules over the dihedral group d2 times 4. 
question two, the dihedral group D2 times phi acts, by definition, on the set of vertices of the pentagon inscribed in the unit circle. Decompose explicitly the linearization of this action into a direct sum of simple modules. Question three, check that the group D2 times four acts by automorphisms of the polynomial algebra CXY, such that the counterclockwise rotation by P over two sends X to Y and Y to minus X, and the reflection in the horizontal line sends X to X and Y to minus Y. After that, determine an explicit decomposition of the linear span of all homogeneous polynomials of degree three into a direct sum of simple modules over this dihedral group. Question four, the group S3 acts on the polynomial algebra in three variables x1, x2, and x3 by automorphisms as follows. So sigma of xi is equal to x with the index sigma of i for any sigma in S3 and i in 1 to 3. Let m and n denote the restrictions of this action to the linear spans of all monomials of degree 2 and 3, respectively. Determine the dimension of the space of all G homomorphisms from m to n. And question 5. Find an explicit decomposition into a direct sum of simple submodules for the tensor product of the defined in module m over the dihedral group d2 times 7 with itself. Thank you very much and see you next time.